Morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. Good. Uh, I wanted to primarily go through uh, uh, feedback on pull request. Uh, I don't know if everyone in the chat has had a chance to go through it. Uh, we can take a few minutes uh, to read through it. Um, I don't see anything else on the agenda. Did we want to add anything to the agenda today besides this pull request? Okay, I think we can uh, read through the session and take more than 10, 15 minutes. Um, so, uh, just wait for everyone to uh, uh, catch up.
Hi, folks. Y'all hear me okay? Yep. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Ian McMillan. I'm from Microsoft. I was uh, speaking with Steve Lasker about this topic, and he invited me to come join in. So I, I actually come from a background of uh, uh, from the team that manages and maintains all of the PKI and code signing services internally for Microsoft. So this this uh, key management scenarios are near and dear to my heart. Cool, cool. If you will. So I, I was just reading through this PR. It, it seems to hit uh, a lot of the main topics and and scenarios that we're concerned with as we look into DT or the Docker Content Trust capability and, and signing for for all of our. Um, product teams and yeah I, I think the the biggest one for me is the way in which keys are generated and managed uh, like all those scenarios being able to cover them is is super important to be able to to have something that can support the the local key store all the way to someone who has uh, uh, net HSMs or even offline HSMs who are generating your keys and and uh, especially the root needing to be generated offline. I think that was one of our biggest challenges as we looked at adoption was the ability for us to to generate a root pair, a root key pair offline, and then being able to have that basically have a public cert that comes out, and any delegate keys being signed by that that private root only in the offline air gapped world is something that we needed to have. Yeah, I think we, um, uh, I, I manage uh, similarly key management for uh, Amazon uh, and uh, sign, code signing for Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had some very similar kind of concerns. And I think that's kind of where we flushed out uh, a lot of the uh, potential different use cases for generating these keys. Uh, I think as we're looking to it, like we're thinking, um, we haven't quite gone into the implementation details, but I'm thinking something around like a PKCS uh, 11 type API uh, would make it both able to use the local key store and potentially uh, any kind of network HSM or cloud HSM. And I think really just having that flexibility. So in individual developers that want to uh, kind of leverage their own uh, laptops if they want to, or just kind of like, you know, get signing started, they have a mechanism to do so. Uh, at the same time, you know, we give enterprises the opportunity to kind of secure their keys, especially if, you know, there's a lot of value to signing as an enterprise. Yeah, totally agree, totally agree. Uh you know, for for me coming from the uh, kind of authentic code signing world and and publicly trusted signing certs as well, I, a lot of those private keys we have uh, key management um, standards and, and ones that are evolving to to require a higher level a higher security bar level where like uh, local software key generation is something more or less that we're we're starting to say that's not going to be acceptable um with with this are we going to run into any kind of similar policy where you know there's there's going to be certain standard bodies that are going to say don't allow uh software generated keys or only allow a certain way of key generation happening, say on a FIPS level 140-2 compliant hardware crypto module. Yeah, 
we haven't really thought it uh, thought through it to that extent. Uh, I think uh, the way I was approaching it was that, uh, at least from a crypto algorithm perspective, uh, we can say which algorithms uh, for key generation meet the bar versus which ones are just insecure and we should just ignore, right? Like we wouldn't want to launch support for SHA-1, for example. Uh, in terms of the uh, key storage requirements, um, Justin, you might be able to weigh in a little bit more on this, but um, are there sort of like uh, requirements we can make in terms of like, you know, how secure key storages have to be, or would that be too onerous for developers? Um, I think that... Um... It's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, I, I would be more inclined to go along a route whereby we had mechanisms for attestation for people who want to use them rather than making it required. Um, because um, I mean, because it's, I mean, you, you can't, you can only do some kind of attestation to prove that someone has generated a key somewhere in hardware, for example, and, um, and it's, that's kind of information you might want, but I don't think we, I don't think there's any way you could ever require that unless you require a, spe a very specific set of um, methods because things yeah. have to be relatively generic. I, I, I'm kind of, I'm following you there, Justin, too. I mean, the way I think about it is, is let's say if, if we had a root key, somebody was asking, Hey, Hey, Microsoft, can you, can you put this in your uh, content registry? And, and and trust you know bring that that trust from my root in, into into your own registry so anything that i sign over here I, you can use there and that's kind of like similar to how we run our trusted root program and you know those fall into the in those cases then if you want us to add that root then we have to see an audit that says yeah you are meeting these certain standards such as uh, key generation in a hardware uh, back solution versus you know if I'm if I'm just doing this in my my home or in my own enterprise I don't have to have those restrictions necessarily yeah I think Ian here from uh... Uh, because there's a wide variety of use cases um, in terms of how the uh, how the, the the process for verification works, I think here we um, allow all use cases. Uh, but in terms of like you know, uh, this doesn't necessarily preclude um, trust stores being managed and set up uh, with their own specific set of rules, right? Uh, and I think that could be a process that happens outside of the the specifications itself, uh, in terms of determining, like you know, when uh, uh, routes are being shared uh, or, or public uh, keys for routes are being shared for trust stores. Um, depending on which trust store you're getting into, there may be some additional requirements that says your keys need to be auditable and uh, meet certain standards. Yeah, I, that's exactly it. I think that sounds sounds good to me. For sure. I think we can even provide guidance about like if you want these properties, this is something you should consider doing. But I don't think we could really mandate that for everyone, depending on their use cases. Yeah, I mean, we Notary V1 came with a set of recommendations, which you didn't, you know, as to how to how we recommended you manage keys, um, which I think is a good thing to have. So um just so that people understand what what good practice looks like at least and that and um um and then we can talk about the things you might want to 
be straighter about. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, looking through the comments, um, Justin, did you have any comments that you wanted to add or? Um, I hadn't quite finished reading the okay. revocation piece, but um, um, I just have a, hold on, I had a comment about something before that. Um, you can wait a few more minutes. Um, yeah. Uh, there was actually there was one comment just on the wording that I was a bit unclear. Right at, uh, at the beginning, line thirty-three, publisher uploads root public keys registry. Registry can verify user for container uploads. What did you mean by registry can verify user for container uploads? There exactly. Uh, let me pull this up. So this was uh, line 35? 33. 33. Um, so this is, um, uh, this is a potential case where <clears throat> um, publishers can register uh, with the uh, registry and specify what their upload keys are. So this is an additional verification uh, that the registry or repository can do. Um, this isn't something that's necessarily essential um, for the deployer to verify it. Uh, it's more an additional check that registry operators could potentially do um, to verify sorry, just that. Can, sorry, I just, I'm a bit confused by the wording. What do you actually, can you just explain what you're saying could happen? I just really, the wording just confuses me, that's all. Can you just explain the? Can you just explain the scenario that's happening? I, I'm slightly confused. What you meant? Who you mean? Who's the who's the user in this sentence? Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I got disconnected for a second. Right. Um, so the the user here is the is the person that's building uh, the artifact, right? So the uh, the person that's kind of building and releasing artifacts, when they generate a new set of keys, uh, they can register those keys with the repository, um, and this essentially kind of enables repositories to verify um, that artifacts came from the uh, publishers. Uh, this isn't necessarily essential um, because we do have another set of verification happening uh, at deployment time. So this is more just an additional safety feature that lets repository owners verify that um, the containers are coming from or the artifacts are coming from the uh, uh, registered sort of publisher. Okay, okay. so... Um... Um... Okay, so so the, okay, right. So this is a sort of pre-verification um, essentially pre-verification check that um, where well, you just do this, you run the same check when things are uploaded mm -hmm. and then you can um, yeah, okay, okay. okay. One thing that was a little bit confusing for me. Um, in this document here and a couple other places is um, like the different roots of trust. So like, um, I know we, we've talked about this before, but the, cause it, there's the, a root of trust where you're trusting stuff that's provided by the, the registry as a whole. And then there's also each repository also has kind of its own trust chain or whatever you want to call it. 
Um, and I think that root is used kind of interchangeably to talk about the root of the registry and the roots of the individual um, repositories on the registry. And I, I or, or maybe I misunderstood, but I, I just found that a little confusing. Yeah, I think um, the, uh, the only place that I'm trying to use root here is uh, root from the uh, view of the uh, of, of the entity that's that's publishing essentially or building our uh, containers, right? So um, this wouldn't necessarily require registries or repositories to maintain their own roots. Um, the the only place where we're generating keys would be the uh, would be individuals or enterprises that are essentially publishing uh, containers based on an identity, um, and so each root would belong to uh, to that entity uh, and that's where the signing keys would chain off of uh, and so um, essentially the distribution then becomes whichever entity is essentially the publisher here um, they're having to distribute their keys to both the repository owners as well as the deployer okay that makes sense so they this is the like yeah, the, you know, the developer or the group of developers, they have like a root, and then that um, is given to clients so that they can verify files and also given to the repository to, to verify them as well? Yes. Okay, cool. I think I understand. So oh, as a, sorry, another side question. Um, how does the repository um, verify that it came from the, the correct person, the, this root key? Um, do they have like a, you know, like an out of band verification process that the repository like performs on it? Some such, or it's like if, it's, if it comes from this account or something? I think it has to be an out of band process. Um, this goes more into how people are registering for different uh, repositories. So if you're registering an account for Docker Hub, uh, whatever mechanism you are going through to validate that you are who you are, who you say you are to Docker Hub, um, as part of that process, you would be registering your keys, right? And then different, uh, uh, different uh, deployment scenarios may have different verification requirements. Um, I didn't necessarily want to specify them in the requirements here. Yeah, that makes sense. It depends a bit on the use case. The one other question or comment that I saw in terms of uh, preventing a replay attack, uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, that's something we can address in the design of the revocation list. Um, there are a few options I think we have there in terms of time stamping CRLs uh, or potentially looking at some other mechanisms uh, to prevent that. Uh, but I think the next step I'd want to do once we have an agreement on the overall specs is really go through a detailed threat model uh, and try and figure out all the different places where we would need similar kind of mechanisms to prevent uh, uh, different kinds of attacks. I think that sounds great because that way we can look at that attack, you know, through all the different pieces and see where it fits in. Yeah. Uh, Ian, Justin, did either of you have any comments? Any other additional comments? Not from me at this initial, kind of, um, I quickly read through it. Justin? I, I mean, so for the, um, Deployment workflow. Um, um, can you just run through the? Can you just run through the deployment workflow just in terms of what the user is validating exactly? 
Uh, yeah, sure. So um, first, um, there's uh, I've split out two deployment workflows. One is the provisioning, uh, which is saying the initial configuration of the trust store. Um, this is essentially saying here are the routes that I trust uh, based on these developers that I know. Uh, and so once you have that trust store configured, uh, whenever you are pulling down an artifact, um, you are checking the signature on that artifact uh, and seeing that it chains up to the roots that you trust. So uh, if, it's tr if it's signed with a, uh, uh, we, we talk about only one key here, which is the signing key. Um, so the signing key needs to chain up to the uh, roots that you have configured. Um, the one thing that we don't talk about here is timestamping. Um, that's something that uh, I think we need to have a separate conversation on, on whether the timestamping key should chain up to the same route or whether it should be a public route. Um, there's some pros and cons that I think we need to address there. Um. But um, I, I gave it. You're making. You, I think you're making some more assumptions about um, what you're actually validating here, aren't you? I mean, so um, how do I know which root key I expect this image to validate against? So you wouldn't necessarily, uh, so the signature would tell you um, which route that signature chains from, right? So this is something that would be expected in the signature itself. Um, and it could match any one of the routes in your list. Um, so we would need to come up with what the root lookup from your trust store looks like. Um, but essentially you're matching um, all, the, uh, all the keys that you have in your local trust store to see if they match up with the key that's presented in the signature. So, so, so your, your, the trust model that you are supporting is that I trust a li effectively a list of people. Yes, list of publishers. List of publishers, and we. Um, I started working a little bit into potentially where how you would get that list. Um, at the very basic, it's an out of band like you know developers are publishing uh, their 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 routes. Um, we can also look into potential aggregation of these routes uh, based on sort of like you know some. Uh, uh, some repository of keys, uh, but we need to kind of walk through what the uh, uh, the business use case or the model or justification for that would look like. At the very basic, from sort of like a publisher to deployer model, um, I think the assumption we'd have to make is the publisher is able to get their keys uh, distributed to people that need to verify um, uh, applications or artifacts coming from them. So, I mean, so effectively you're ruling out supporting TAF. I think the way I would look at it is like comparing this against TAF uh, and seeing sort of what the pros and cons are. I think one of the issues we had with TAF was the, uh, the automatic configuration um, that we wanted to get away from, right? One of the uh, key aspects of signing should be being able to specify that here are the parties I trust rather than trusting parties uh, because they are coming from a repository, right? Uh, and I think in that, in that scenario, that's kind of where the tough uh, model starts, I think, breaking down a little bit. Well, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, I got, go on, Marina, you can, you can, you can yeah, I think that. one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is um, kind of like splitting it in half so that, um, if especially for more like open source projects and those kind of entities, um, you can you know build that trust from the repository, but then you have like a second option of building trust using a third party system, using the same um, repository, but you kind of establish trust in these two different ways so that if you 
um, you know, don't want to trust everything on a registry, for example, or if you only want to trust um, developers that you kind of specifically know, then you can do this, this separate process, but you could also get things from the registry if that's easier and if the, the security concerns aren't as major. Yeah, and I think what I'd want to kind of look into more there is if we can turn that more into a um, registry, if you will, of roots um, that you that you want to aggregate together. Um, that's one approach of looking at it, um, but that's that's something I think we have flexibility for in terms of figuring out how we want to address that. Um, but I think uh, I, I'd agree that like you know there there needs to be a mechanism where we you can narrow down to exactly specifically which publishers you want to trust, but there's also value in getting that automated um, sort of list of uh, uh, of developers or participants, let's say in an open source community that you want to trust by default. So in that model, would we necessarily need <coughs> um, tough as it sits or would potentially like um, repositories also having like a, uh, um, a, a repository of keys uh, be sufficient? Yeah, I think it would kind of be like a little bit of both. So you'd have the, because there, there are like other protections that TUF also provides, but I think that you could build this on top of those. Um, that's kind of where, where I was thinking with this. Um, is that you you kind of build this like um, the second mechanism for a different way of establishing trust in specific keys, but then you use those keys in tough to then verify like timeliness, consistency, all those other properties. I think that in concept that makes sense. I think we'll want to flush that out a little bit um, just to make sure that um, all the workflows um, make sense and, and we're thinking about them accurately. But yeah, I envision that, you know, like at, at this core, like really we're saying, here's how the keys get distributed. How the key gets distributed is something that um, we have, we aren't necessarily specking down here. And I think Tuff could just as easily, well, kind of like, you know, uh, be that mechanism for, um, for, if you want to kind of build that collective trust, I think that could totally work. All right, yeah, I'll keep thinking about it and maybe try and spec something out and share it with the group. Uh, yeah, I think it would be helpful to write this, because because this, the use case document effectively is in, is implying uh, what I want, how I want to validate things here, and I think that's not is not the right place for that to be. I think we need to write down specifically what we're trying to, what the users' security guarantees that they're trying to enforce actually are separately, um, or what they what or what kinds of things we can support there. Um, because I think it, we need to be very specific about this because it, um, um, otherwise, otherwise people, because I think one of the problems is that people need to understand what guarantees they're getting and see if those are the ones they've actually wanted. Yeah, I think I can flesh out a little bit more about um, what's actually getting verified here. Um, I think the root distribution addresses a slightly different problem in which it's saying, um, how do I know that I trust uh, this key to relate to this person? And I think Tuff has a way of solving that. Um, there's potentially other ways we can look at for solving that. Um, I don't think those necessarily need to get specced out in the key management, but I do think you're right. The key management does need to call out that uh, in terms of if you've identified that I trust this public key, how does that um, how does that chain down into sort of like the artifact that I'm getting? So I think we can separate out those two uh, and we can have like a, a tough implementation that looks at the, uh, looks at how to configure the trust stores um, and, and we can we can take some several more passes at that. Because I, I think there are, I mean, there are definitely potential issues with this. Like I might, um, I, I'm, I mean, I think, um, you know, I might, I might only trust certain publishers for certain 
things, um, on certain use cases or certain. I mean, I only I only trust I might only trust Microsoft to, for um, for Excel and not trust Microsoft for Visual Studio, say, and things like that. As things so like just chaining to a Microsoft key is actually quite a weak statement. I think that's a good call out. Um, I think here we'll probably need to expand uh, the key configuration to also uh, potentially uh, include uh, targets uh, or some other field that says that like, you know, here's the key I would trust for this application itself. Uh, that's that's something I think that we can, uh, we can definitely add in. Um, I think it, if, it, if it comes down to one where um, you can blindly trust different publishers or you can trust publishers for different applications. I think we've seen both of those use cases. So um, that's something we can add in. Um, I haven't quite followed where we were with the um, SBOM um, sort of like uh, um, integration. Um, is this better addressed through the SBOM sort of integrations or should that really be handled here at the key management layer? Um, well, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, um, well, there's a slightly recursive problem in that if I don't trust the signature, if I don't know if I trust the signature, I can't see if it's, I have to trust someone to assign the SBOM in order to have actually, in order to validate it. Um, but, but yes, I would, I probably trust Microsoft I trust Microsoft to sign, if it signs an SBOM that says the thing comes from Microsoft after I, potentially, at which point then I know what it is, at which point then I can decide if I trust it for my application I'm doing here, potentially, uh, something along those lines. Yeah, because I think the other issue is that <clears throat> if you're not, trusting Microsoft to tell you what it is in the first place, right? Um, it doesn't matter if you scope it down, like they could still give you Visual Studios instead of giving you Excel and just sign it as Excel, right? Yeah. Uh, I think there's 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 something more we'll have to think about, like, you know, how to but, potentially... But yeah, there's also the, I mean, there's the, but there's the actual case where I, I trust them for both Visual Studio and Excel, but not for uh, Docker. And therefore, well, I, so I don't want them to go around um, so, uh, maybe that's not a good example either. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that just once you, if you have a large, if you just have this set of keys, that's not you definitely might want some sort of policy on top of them. Yeah, I think the, the policy makes sense. It's one where I'd argue that signatures might not be the right place to kind of enforce that or key configurations might not be the right place to enforce that. Um, because when you say you're trusting the key um, you are to a certain extent trusting the publisher to take certain actions, right? Uh, and if the publisher themselves um, were the method of attack, then trusting the key doesn't necessarily protect you or trusting the uh, uh, them telling you which application yeah. it's itself. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yes, that's true. Um, I, I do like the kind of the general model and idea of some level of stratification across a 
a large organization, say like the in the Microsoft example, uh, I'd love to have the ability to be able to issue keys to say the office, the office group, and uh, then there's even subordinate keys under that that are specific to each application for folks to to be able to pin trust say to the Microsoft root is fine but uh, then from a blast radius in case of key compromise say if the office key needs to be revoked it doesn't revoke the Microsoft generic key it just revokes the the office and I'm able to issue a new one off of that Microsoft route and not harm my other say business group say as a developer division anything that comes out of Visual Studios. Yeah I think that's kind of where our best practice guidance comes in that ideally you would have a route and you would separate out all your different products into different intermediates or subordinates and um, people then have the option of trusting either the intermediate or the uh, or the route itself right yeah uh, and that's that's really more like a best practice guidance than that comes out. Yeah, I'm trying to understand Justin's. I, I can feel he has a concern here, <laughs> and I'm trying to, um, I'm just trying to uh, root yeah, it out just, a bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, No, I know that's a concern we've talked about before, right? Um, and so I think um, to me, the an SBOM integration feels like a right way to limit packages um, uh, because then you, you've said to a certain extent that I trust whoever has sent this to me um, to uh, tell me what it is. And then I have this next layer of, of filtering to say I'm getting the right sort of packages that I want to have and install and use. Yeah. Um, but what about, what about the, what about the use case where, um, every, every vendor in the world publishes Kubernetes, but I, when I'm, if I'm trying to validate my Kubernetes installation, I actually only want to trust one of them. I guess I just have a set of root keys I use for validating Kubernetes and that's what I use for that circumstance. So what I know I'm trying to run Kubernetes. I think what we're, what we're gonna need is some kind of like client defined map um, thing. Um, where like the client can define or you know or the user or whoever can define, okay, so I want Kubernetes from this publisher with this key. I want um, Microsoft Office from this publisher with this key and so on. And so that way you could, so that they have the ability, not like the requirement, but the ability to define those things more fine-grainedly, depending on how fine-grainedly they've decided who they trust for these various products. A hundred percent agree. I mean, the ability to, to support a curation of these are the things that I want only. I don't want this version or that version from this publisher. It is super powerful. And frankly, I mean, as you do your deployments, I, at least for our services, I even look at, I, I only run things that I've signed, even though they've been signed by the producer. The, the, I'm a consumer of, of that content at that point. And I'm just saying, hey, yes, this, this is allowed to run in my environment. 
Yeah, I mean, we have we had quite a lot of people trying to use Notary V1 as effectively as a signed workflow management tool, and that's kind of how they thought about it. So, if I sign it, that means it's a it's okay for this to happen to it. Um, um, I. Um, I mean, it's, which is, yeah, which is, which is a different kind of model though, if you're actually doing it as workflows, I mean, it's kind of what Intoto's design is about really, um, you know, where you have a set of things that have to happen, you want to have signatures that they have. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like the layer that I saw <clears throat> this validation happening more in. Um, and so um, the question comes in and also in terms of like, you know, what else is being presented in the base signature itself or uh, potentially in the information that's coming in that lets us know that this application is Microsoft Office, right? Um, do we want to potentially tie it down to something in the artifact itself? Um, are there things that we can kind of like limit it to that aren't necessarily changing with uh, versions or updates? I think that's one we can take as an action item. Um, I will come back with an answer for that one um, uh, next week um, and see what are the different ways we have for addressing that. Because I think it is a use case we want to we we want to solve for. I think where our disagreement right now is um, where in the workflow we solve for that. So I'll come up with some suggestions for that. Yeah, I think that would be. Helpful. I, mean, I think I'm just trying to, because I think that it just, we need to ha explain how people can address these use cases, if they can. Okay, um, I'll address that. Um, any other comments? Okay, um, I'm gonna add those to the notes for the next revision. Um, the one other thing I wanted to kind of uh, uh, spend sort of five minutes on. Um, in other signing areas, um, typically whenever we rely on timestamp, we re rely on a public timestamping authority um, rather than using the same uh, route to generate both the uh, timestamp intermediate as well as the signing intermediate. Um, I wanted to get some uh, feedback on whether that was something that was considered for notary v1 or if there's any sort of like objections to that approach. Um, I mean that came far tough. Um, I don't um, I don't know Marina, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, I think it, um, I think that the short answer is that it kind of depends. I think it is important to have a consistent view of time. I think the thought was that because, um, 
you know, applications on the internet generally have synced time clocks anyway. Um, you can utilize that source of time and it'll be all right. But in um, other deployments of TUF, this has been a concern, um, making sure that the time source is secure and is accurate um, because, yeah, if, you can even like accidentally dial a service yourself if the computer that's signing something thinks the time is, you know, tomorrow and then no one else, or, or yesterday, and then no one can download it because they think it's outdated. Um, so I think it is definitely something that we should think about, but I don't know if we need a whole separate solution for it or if we just need to make sure that the times are accurate. Okay. Right, but, the, but the question was, should timestamp keys be chained off the root key or is it okay to chain them off some other public timestamp key that you trust for timing information separately? Well, Certainly. for me, it just adds, you know, an extra complexity and an extra thing that could be compromised. But um, there's no there's no other reason not to, as long as you, you trust that other thing. Yeah, for timestamping, right, like we do rely on public timestamp services that are pretty resilient. Um, so uh, I know, for example, for uh, authentic code signatures, um, you know, you can use Digicert, you can use Komodo, you can use a lot of uh, different uh, timestamping authorities that are out there. Uh, and this is a service that's generally free. Um, and so uh, it's it, it, in that regards, I think because there is a uh, free timestamping service that's available that, uh, you know, uh, these certificate authorities are doing all the audit, providing all the information for, um, we, uh, I, ha I don't necessarily see a higher risk there. Um, I think it adds more mitigations, but um, I, before I kind of like wrote up a doc on it, I just wanted to make sure that this, whether this was considered or not, and, 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 get some feedback on what yeah. prior considerations were. And I can um, double check with um, folks who are around earlier in the tough process, but I think that basically the, the, the services are newer than, than they, they were, you know, they were newer when tough was first being written. And so they didn't yeah. have the same um, trust. And so, yeah, but I can look into that more. Yeah, I would, I would second what, as you're saying here, I mean, every single CA who issues publicly trusted, code signing certificates is required to offer a timestamping service for free uh, and maintain it to a certain level that is also audited. Uh, so I, I think they're, they're totally reputable and they add a, a good layer of counter signature in that regard too. It comes down to the question of, whatever is verifying it, does it have a reliable time sync that it can source from when validating a timestamp? I wouldn't want to restrict it to only like the, the timestamp has to come off of the same route as the, the signature itself the key that was used to sign. Yeah, part of the concern we had there was that typically if you have a um, public timestamp with a different route, um, if for any reason you revoke uh, your key based on a compromise, uh, you can also set a time of revocation. Um, so you don't necessarily need to revoke everything you've ever signed. Uh, but if your root is compromised and your root was also used for the time stamping, then um, you pretty much have no option but to revoke everything. So um, from our perspective, the public, public time stamping service kind of give, gave you that second layer of protection. Yep, totally agree with you. Okay, um, I think we have uh, a list of next steps. Uh, Marina, um, I'm gonna put your name on some of the action items for looking into tough, and then I'll take the other ones for some of the clarifications for the spec. Uh, does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. All right, I think we're at time. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks all.